I'm Elizabeth Nix from Aspen Words, and on behalf of the whole team, welcome to The Writer's Journey, the sixth and final literary talk in our Summer Words series. For those of you joining us for the first time, Aspen Words is a literary nonprofit based in Colorado, and our mission is to encourage writers, inspire readers, and connect people through stories. This mission feels particularly vital right now, while so many people are isolated and looking for a connection through shared stories and literary community. We also want to acknowledge the important role that we must play both as individuals and as a literary organization in the racial reckoning that's taking place across America. As part of this Summer Words series, we've hosted panels that have explored some of these questions through the lens of literature and publishing. A few housekeeping notes. Uh, throughout this event, we will be using the chat box on your screen to post links and other information. Right now, you'll see a link to our virtual bookshelf with Summer Words speaker books available for purchase. Um, a percentage of all book sales from the shelf go to support our local indie bookstore, Explore Booksellers, right here in Aspen. We set aside about um, 15 minutes or so at the end of tonight's discussion for audience questions. Please use the Q&A feature in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen to ask the panelists a question. Uh, you can submit your questions at any time during the talk, and we will get to as many as we can. There's been no charge for any of our Summer Words panels. However, if you're in a position to make a donation, we ask that you consider supporting one of the nonprofits suggested by tonight's panelists. Links to those groups are posted in the chat. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. I'll keep it brief as their full bios are linked in the chat. Our moderator tonight is Carolyn Torrey, Managing Director of Aspen Words. And we are very excited to have four terrific writers and former Summer Words alumni on the panel. Stephanie Dandler, author of the best-selling novel Sweet Bitter and the new memoir Stray. Trapita B. Mason, Philadelphia's Poet Laureate and a performer and teaching artist. Si Pam Zhang, author of the new novel, How Much of These Hills is Gold. And Eileen Zimmerman, journalist and author of the new memoir, Smacked, a story of white collar ambition, addiction, and tragedy. And with that, I'll hand it over to Carolyn. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, it's such a treat to be here with you all. Uh, one of the silver linings of this virtual Summer Words Conference is the ability to bring these four writers together, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Um, so the title of this talk is The Writer's Journey, and I want to start by talking about the most recent leg of that journey, which I would imagine has been... Um, unexpected and tumultuous, especially for those of you with new books out or in Trapita's case, launching into a, a new role as Poet Laureate in Philly. Um, so let's start with you, Stephanie. I think your book came out, your memoir, very recently, and I'd love to know just how you've been coping and how this pandemic has impacted um, the launch of your book and your work as a writer right now. It is, um, I'm trying to find the mixed blessing of it all. It's definitely not ideal, or maybe it's just so different from my first experience publishing a book. Um, we talked earlier, I'm like extremely pregnant, like I'm due in four weeks, and I would have been on tour to 14 cities, and I definitely am not missing that part of it. But what I have found I've really missed is that energy exchange with readers every night, with looking out to a room of people, seeing writers you admire, seeing friends, um, that kind of tactile nature that readings um, can have. And without that, there's a lot of digital intimacy, which has been, which we're doing right now. It's been very fulfilling, but without, 
the the actual energy exchange it feels a little bit like dropping the book off into a void and you're like bye did that happen did i write it no one knows um and that's that's where i am now a lot of surrender this whole period of time has just been about surrender but people are reading and we have you know, lots of people here this evening. So it's not all sad. Yeah. How about you, Pam? You've also, how much of these hills just came out a month or so ago? How has that been for you, similar to Stephanie or? Yeah. So this is my debut novel, so I have no other experience to to compare it to. This is how it's, it's always been for me. I think um, the word I return to most often is is surreal. Um, Stephanie sort of touched on this, but you know, as writers, one, I started this book in 2015, five years ago, and since then it's like been alive in my mind, and even the way the book industry works, I've seen like printed copies of the book for like over six months. Um, so then there was, there felt like there was no real like crossing of the finish line for me. The day my book came out was for me the same kind of day. I had copies of it already. Um, people, some people I knew had already read it, and it has been a little bit surreal. I saw someone on Twitter say that these kinds of um, these kinds of digital events, while I agree, are like really wonderful in their own ways. They feel for for the writer, I think, a little bit like performing for an audience of ghosts. Um, mm. We can't see your faces, uh, and if we do have any uh, interaction, it is mediated through this digital medium. So for me, it's it's been surreal, but I am also trying. I think for me, I, my, any worries I had about my book quickly transitioned into worries about um, the independent bookstores and that whole part of the industry because like books have very, very long lives. So I do feel confident that despite things coming out in this pandemic, they, they will be read and they will find their audiences. Yeah, we had a panel on publishing a couple of days ago and they, they did give us hope, um, but independent bookstores are such a big part of that. So, um, and Trapita, you became, Poet Laureate of Philly in um, January. So what's that been like, trying to do this new job amidst a pandemic? It's been challenging. I mean, I'm still a big part of me as a, as a writer and specifically as a Poet Laureate was to be able to reach out into spaces and communities that are not, you know, can't easily access, you know, things like this, this panel or you know, these readings. So I, while I've done some things um, through the virtual world, um, my hope, uh, it's a two-year tenure, so I'll still have time. And I, my project is focusing on mental health and centering poetry as a way to destigmatize mental health, raise awareness. But a big part of that was being able to get into the streets, to get with young people, people in, um, you know, homeless shelters, and just bring poetry um, just make it more accessible. So it's interesting that with the pandemic and the virtual world, you still have a lot of people that can access it, but there's still a good number of people that I had hoped to reach through this position that I'm not able to reach right now. Um, and so that's my, that's my regret. Um, but my project has three phases, so I will be able to launch all of them before I'm done, as well as participate in really exciting projects with other writers. Well, we're looking forward to following along. Um, and Eileen, your memoir, your debut book came out in February. So just before everything changed, tell us a bit about how it's been for you. So it's been, um, it's interesting when Stephanie was talking about surrender, I was thinking I definitely, that's the word to describe it. Like it, there's such a build up to it. And uh, for me, it's based on a, like a personal tragedy that happened and there's some reporting in it about um, professionals using opioids. And at the time that it came out, the opioid crisis was still very top of the news. And in a month, the whole world changed. And so I feel lucky on the one hand that I had a month to be out there and actually meet with readers and promote the book that way, but then everything changed. And I think the biggest challenge for me is um, trying to be, I mean, it's very difficult to be heard no matter what your book is now because there's so much going on in the culture and politically and economically. And um, as a nonfiction, as a memoir, um, it's not particularly escapist. It's not like a novel that you can really just, you know, you can dive into it, but it's not gonna 
take you away from uh, reality, let's say. So it's been, it's been a little bit more difficult. On the other hand, I have, because of this new mode of connecting with readers, I have been able to connect with a lot of readers um, in all sorts of places and in other countries. And I feel like I am increasingly becoming more adept at using it to connect with people. Um, but I think I probably share how Stephanie feels about sort of surrendering to the moment. And I just keep thinking also like what Pam said, you know, I don't, I don't think any of us knows how this story is going to end, what's going on currently in, in the world or with our books. And so I'm trying to just like live in the present and think like, you know, I'll do everything I can to, to promote my books and other books and support independent bookstores and all of that and just kind of see how it goes. So that's where I'm at. Yeah, it's, it's been great to see how adaptive um, so many writers are being um, right now and, and we at Aspen Words have been able to enjoy a lot of that content coming from all over the place. Um, so I want to rewind now actually to the, the start of your journeys um, as writers. And I'm curious um, whether there was support in your home and family um, for literature and your decision to become a writer. Were, were there books um, in your homes as children and um, was writing appreciated and, and valued? Um, in your family growing up. Um, let's start uh, with Pam. I know you traveled a lot as a child, so I'm curious how that might have played into your uh, trajectory. Muted for a second. Um, yeah, so I moved around a lot as a kid and we weren't well off, so I actually owned almost no books and libraries were really my entry point into reading. And also because I was an immigrant, I moved here at four years of age. My, my mother really saw reading as a way to, to instruct me. It was free education. So there were, it was encouraged, but there were kind of like interesting values associated with writing and reading that I no longer hold in that exact same way. For example, um, we would go to the library every week, but I would be told I could only read X many fiction books and had to check out nonfiction books as well because reading was truly just seen as like an instrument for learning and learning was seen as an instrument to get ahead and sort of like catapult yourself into a better and more stable life. Um, which is now very different from the way I approach, you know, writing fiction and writing literary fiction in particular. How about do others want to jump in here? What about you, Trapita? Um, I know you also emigrated to the to the U.S. from um, Liberia growing up, and so I'm curious how that journey. Yeah, was. so I, I share some of Pan's uh, story. I was also an immigrant and joined my parents here in Philadelphia. I was um, eight years old uh, when we came in May of that year, and I'm also from one of those households where we my parents didn't, you know buy books or have a bunch of books, but I had a lot of access to books through the library. And I also uh, am from a household where my parents um, really believed in education. So they used to pay on the encyclopedias. You know, there were those ones, I, I can't remember, but I just remember we had several volumes of the ones with some with the pictures and the words. And those are the things I grew up kind of reading early in addition to school books. So although they weren't buying those books that I came to discover and devour later, like the Toni Morrison's and the Seal Clifton, I didn't have those in my, uh, you know, household as a young person, but I had access through the public library. And I certainly, I was always an avid reader, but the early memory of them paying every week or every month for those encyclopedias until we had all of them was a really, really, it, I just thought about it now. That was a very important memory. Um, so whereas they didn't have those books, they knew that it was important for us to get that knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, it's, it's always interesting to hear about how the presence of books or searching for books yeah. is always a key part of, of that sort of evolution into becoming a writer. And um, Eileen, I'm curious, did, did, when you told your family um, and friends that you were making your kind of a big career pivot, how, how did they react? How did... Oh, because I'm, and now I'm, well, I'm, I looked at it like a pivot, not a change. So I went back to graduate, I went 
back to school for social work. Um, but it seemed kind of like a natural progression because I, I have spent much of my writing career writing about business, but also um, that's because that's where I could get work. And so I wound up kind of deciding, oh, I'm going to be a business writer because this is where I can make a living. Um, but I also really was interested in writing more about social issues and political issues. Um, and so I looked at kind of pivoting to social work as a way to also writing about more issues having to do with social justice and mental health and economic and racial disparities and things like that. And I'd always been a volunteer and an activist, so kind of political activist, feminist, um, and I volunteered at a school for homeless kids in San Diego for many years and really became interested in that while I was writing, mostly business. Um, so, and I, but I have been a writer. Um, I grew up in a home just like everyone else where we had a lot of financial insecurity. My parents were kind of obsessed with the Kennedy administration and conspiracy theories. So there were a lot of those kinds of books. <laughs> <laughs> and my mother read, um, you know, like novels and stuff. So it, but it, it was also the library. It was where I got most of my um, books and I read a ton as a kid, lived kind of in that world. And when I was seven, um, I put out a series of like mystery stories that my father had photocopied at his like engineering office and I sold them to my sisters in, in our house. So um, I kind of always thought I was going to be a writer and, and I still am. Yeah. How, how about you, Stephanie? Are there early stories like that? And, and how did, how did your, I know your recent memoir goes into this a little bit, but tell us more about your early decision um, to start writing. Um, like many parents, uh, I I'd like to imagine my mom would have been supportive in that way if she had the time, but she was a single mother and um, my artistic development in kindergarten wasn't at the top of her priority <laughs> list, but I was writing all the time and I loved to read and I tell an anecdote in my book, Stray, about writing a ghost story in second grade that is a slumber party that ends in a murder-suicide and being called into, I went to a Catholic school, um, the nun's office. And my grandparents essentially raised us part-time and my first book is dedicated to them. But my grandmother came and picked me up for that meeting and I was on the way home that she had me read the story aloud and told me that I was a writer and never to stop writing. And so while when you asked the question, I was like, I've been supported by people my entire life to write. Those people weren't necessarily my parents, those teachers, teachers and friends, parents, and the kindness of strangers, really, that kept me going. Well, we're glad they did. We've all been the beneficiaries. Um, I want to zoom ahead a little bit to... Um, education and the decision uh, to do or not do an MFA, which is a question we get a lot from participants in the conference. And I think this panel is actually, I think, 50-50 split between those of you who, who did go that route, the MFA route, and others who didn't or chose different master's degrees than Eileen in Trapita's case. So, Pam, could you start by telling us a bit about your decision to get an MFA and how that's played into your career? Yeah, um, <laughs> the weird thing I'll say right now is I do have an MFA from the IL Writers Workshop, but it actually didn't have any part to play in either my career or sort of like my formation as a writer. I think like my entire, my entire career as a writer has been one of having a foot outside of the realm of writing because it, I just never felt safe placing all my bets on writing. It is, you know, not a financially lucrative field that one can count on. Um, so I got my MFA after working for a full year for four years in the San Francisco tech world and having this completely alternate career, which I actually still still do. I just like came onto this call from a Zoom call for work. Um, and so for me, the MFA was really, in a weird way, it was about it was about time and it was also a little bit of a test to myself. Um, I think like I took a year off to write and to apply to the programs, programs because I was like, I felt like I needed some kind of institutional marker 
to tell me like, this is it, you're a writer somehow, um, do this. But the funny thing was I actually wrote my novel, you know, the first drafts of it before the MFA started. And it, guess what, institutions stamp of approval don't actually give you anything as a writer as much as it may feel like they, they can. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting to think about. Um, and I'd love to hear now from you, Trapita, um, I know you have an MBA degree and a social work degree. Did you ever consider the MFA and um, as a poet, how's that? Been? Yeah, I considered it, it was like uh, for about three seconds, you know, it was a flash. <laughs> so, you know, for me, uh, it was always about uh, survival. Um, uh, you know, survival and truth telling, I think for me was like the two themes. Um, in terms of like career path here, yeah, I'm, I'm a licensed clinical social worker and, and then I went on to do an MBA. And I think it's something Pam said about just, you know, having, being able to make a living. I mean, of course, you're not going to get rich from being a social worker or, you know, um, um, but it's just something steady. A lot of my approach um, to writing and my experiences with writing has always been on the periphery, on the outskirts of the voices that were out here, you know, publishing and writing in terms of the poetry. Um, so I never really looked there for validation. It just felt early on that I'm, I'm probably not going to get it from there, so I don't really need it from there. Um, but the reason why I didn't choose to go to MFA path is because I really just needed to get into a career, you know, um, it was a lot about struggle in my early years when my parents working two jobs and, you know, mom got sick. A lot of things were happening. So I didn't really think it felt like the luxury at the time. And then when I could possibly go into doing it, I had already felt pretty good about my poetic voice. I still do workshops and, you know, trainings and things that I need. But I just didn't feel like I, I, I didn't feel feel like I needed it anymore. I've always been a full-time artist and a full-time employed person. Um, and, I, and I've gotten in recent years very comfortable with both of those things. So I didn't feel like I was missing anything. Yeah, I think that's the story, it seems, for most writers. I mean, save for a very, very few mega bestsellers, it's, you know, it's hard to be a full-time writer and you need to have other, other jobs. And mm -hmm. Um, and I'm at this, that made me think of um, you, Stephanie, pr uh, being an executive producer on the TV ap adaptation of your first novel. Um, I'd love to hear about kind of that decision to juggle that while working on your next book um, and to kind of have this new, this new job, asides from being a writer. Um, yeah, it really is all about the day job. Um, I think that you get into trouble when you are writing books for paychecks, um, artistically and financially. So I had never really watched TV, had no desire to write television. And at a certain point, the opportunity was presented to me and I thought, this is a free PhD with really smart people that's going to give me an entirely new skill set and I'm going to make more than I would writing books and why don't I try it? And I really approached it as a student the whole time, you know, I was in every single meeting, things that were way over my head, oftentimes just keeping my mouth shut, trying to keep up, inserting myself as I became more confident. I mean, it reminded me a lot of my early days in restaurants where you're just trying to learn the language and the codes and the customs. And then we made two seasons of that television show. And by the second season, I was definitely more in my power. But I think that if I had tried to write Stray, with my memoir, I tried to write any book, you know, Sweet Bitter, I wrote during graduate school with no one emailing me, no one cared if I finished it. All of my friends and professional acquaintances thinking that this was a lark and a waste of money. And I think that if I ever got into a place where I was trying to create a book 
for a deadline with the fiscal responsibility, I I don't even I don't I wouldn't know how to write like that. And so I would much rather write scripts. I would much rather teach. I'd rather write magazine articles and keep my art separate as much as possible. Yeah, having that kind of not fallback plan, but something to balance the pressure out, I think makes a lot of sense. Is that something, Eileen, um, you've experienced, I know you are now embarking on this new career in, in social work. Will you continue to write while doing that? Yes, in fact, I just had an essay in the Times last week that was kind of really nice because it sort of combined, it wasn't about business, it was uh, about resilience and trauma, which is in the memoir because we survived this thing and came through it, and me personally. And, um, and I was able to use that and combine it with what I've learned. I'm almost done with my um, MSW. And Trapeet, I have so much respect for you. It's amazing. <laughs> um, but all of your stories are just fascinating and I completely relate. And I think it's, it is so hard to make a living as a writer. I will tell you that um, my best year as a freelancer, after freelancing for 30 years, I made $70,000. It was right before my ex-husband died and I had carpal tunnel and frozen shoulder from typing like every second. My kids were not home or, you know, and so I just think it, it is, it is really hard. Um, it's a hard way to make a living. And I was lucky because for a long time I was married to a lawyer. So I still earned kind of my keep, but I didn't have the pressure of supporting my family. I could be the side income. Once we divorced, I, I felt that very keenly. And I was, and I didn't go get an MFA for the same reasons Trapita didn't are because, um, and I, I wasn't in the tech world, so I wasn't making like a salary that would allow me to. There was just, it was not even a question. It was financially out of the question. I had to, I just had to work, you know, whether I was waiting tables or writing or, um, and so maybe it's kind of odd that I picked a profession that also pays <laughs> very little, but, uh, you know, social work. But I feel like the combination will allow me to, um, to do good in the world and, also, and maybe to, to write and do some good as well. So, but that is why I didn't pick an MFA. It always seemed like a huge luxury and it, that it might be really fun, but it just felt like it wasn't available to me. I'm, I'm so glad you brought up um, your, your piece on resiliency because um, I wanted to ask you and everyone about that, that part of this process of being a writer, um, especially a lot of your recent, uh, the books that um, Eileen and Stephanie and Pam have just written and Trapita, your poetry covers some really heavy topics. Um, and I'm curious how you kind of take care of yourself as a human while you're writing about some of these traumas and how you kind of prevent yourself from falling into despair. I mean, you're covering things like abuse, addiction, immigration, racism. So um, I'd love to hear more about that. Maybe you could start us off, Pam. Um, the easy question. <laughs> um, oh man, how do I? Well, I will confess that every single draft of my novel that I ever finished, I had like a huge crying jag sometime in the next couple of days. Often I couldn't tell at the time that it was really the novel that had caused it, but, but that's what it was. Um, yeah, I think sort of like, this is related very much to, to the question of day jobs and the very question of sort of tying not just finances, but I think productivity and hours to writing, which is that, um, you know, writing is not a capitalist endeavor and therefore it cannot be governed by a capitalist clock. Like, it's good to have, I guess, like a day job where you get up every day and you have to do something at 9 a.m., etc. But for writing, I've always felt that kind of pressure um, in terms of time and productivity was also having a deleterious effect on what I was producing. Um, so to me, I think part of, part of the, that, that question of resiliency really comes down to letting yourself, giving yourself permission to leave the page for months, in some case, even years if necessary, and sort of like, yeah, creating a sort of fallow ground within yourself, um, giving yourself the ability to go and do things that are fun, that are not at all related until you, you feel that urgency and that sort of emotional question building up again for the next work. Yeah, do you, that's helpful. Do you have any strategies for that, Stephanie? I, I can only imagine how writing Stray, kind of unpacking 
your whole childhood and how you kind of manage that? So awful. I mean, <laughs> re I think any writer here on this panel, reliving or re-inhabiting a depression or a particularly dark time or a trauma is scarily akin to being depressed and being in trauma. And I had a five month old when I was starting this draft and I would come out of the office to nurse him and just be so confused about whether I was safe or not, or whether our family was safe. And um, but I agree with Pam, which is just to live in the real world as much as possible. And if that's as simple as getting outside and changing locations, um, I did get very into meditating once I became pregnant and couldn't self-medicate in all my favorite ways. Um, and that's been helpful. But I don't know. The, the book actually is still quite heavy to me. Like it didn't, it didn't transition into catharsis the way one would hope it does. And so I think that that's something that I'll figure out down the line. But in the moment, I mean, coming back to the people that you love, your friends, laughter, the, the keeping yourself accountable to the beauty in the world and not just locking yourself in your office with Kleenexes and really sad shit written on note cards. <laughs> um, getting outside. That's my, that's my lifestyle advice. Colorado is a good place for that. <laughs> yes. Um, Eileen, was your process of writing smacked cathartic? And just for people who haven't read the book yet, it opens with her discovering her ex-husband dead from complications due to drug use. And, and so, and then, um, so it's a memoir, but also goes into kind of this wider problem of white collar drug addiction. So some heavy stuff. And I, but did writing that book help you kind of understand that narrative of your own story? Yes, it did. I had, um, when uh, Peter was my ex-husband, after he died and after I found him and kind of unraveled the mystery of what had happened, I was also his executor for two years because it was in probate. It was such a mess because he, he was addicted and just not doing anything that he needed to do in his life. And um, so I felt like I was really angry that whole time and that kind of powered me through it. And I had teenage kids and I was like, I'm just going to fix this up and settle it. And then I moved back to New York and I uh, wrote about it for the New York Times. And from that, then I started writing this memoir. And during the writing of it, I definitely feel like I was able to start grieving. Like before I was just so angry that I didn't let myself feel the loss of, you know, this person that had been my parenting partner and a partner of mine for, you know, 25 years. Um, and um, somebody who could be very difficult, but also who I actually missed a lot. And um, and writing, as um, Stephanie said, it was really heavy, but it was really good, too. I found myself crying a lot and sort of revisiting places because we had started our relationship in New York and in upstate New York and kind of coming to terms with what happened. It felt really good. And, um, and I think one of the ways, like I take care of myself in a very similar way to Stephanie or Pam, like getting outside, hiking. I also meditate now. I joined a Zen center in New York and things like that. Um, but I think also the act of doing social work, like now I work in an organization where we counsel cancer patients and that is really, can be really bleak, but it also like helps me like get over myself. So when I feel like, oh, I'm so, you know, this is so heavy. I think like, you know what, <laughs> there, there, there's other forms of suffering and like being in the middle of COVID here in New York, it, you know, I think it enables me to get out of my own head and understand that, you know, like it's okay you know, I'm going to be okay. And there's a lot of other stuff going on. That kind of thing kind of keeps you in the real world and not just in the world that you are writing about and that, you know, you living it over and over. Right. And Trapita, with poetry, are you usually writing your poems while you're experiencing things? I mean, I was, we were talking earlier about the poem you just wrote for the Pew Center that's mm -hmm. very closely linked to a pandemic, or do you need time to kind of process I think it's more of the latter. I, I tend to need time to process, but we're in the times of really urgent stories. Um, so whether I want to or not, these things come flooding. 
Uh, other people were talking about respite. And for me, it's um, reflecting outdoor activities. Um, faith for me is big, prayer and, um, and silence. Uh, I've had to do a lot of self-reflection. But there's a strong, and to my, in my core, I believe that things are going to be okay. And so that's the way that I move in the world. So these stories, we, we talked about um, George Floyd's um, murder and, and all of the activities that have happened before and since. Um, also pandemic, all these things are happening around us. And I, I consider these urgent stories. So sometimes I'm flooded with images and words and I want to get it on paper. But we also talked about our day jobs. And although um, it's great to be able to have a, that job and not have to stress so much with the writing, there's a certain pressure too that goes with being occupied for the most part, nine to five or nine to six or seven, depending on how, you know, how many hours we work per day. And also in my line of work, I work in community mental health um, and having the, the bandwidth to then come back and process everything and deal with what's coming at you and being really fatigued <laughs> with everything else going on in the world and still being able to write. So for me, I take it when I, as I get it. Um, sometimes I have to pause and reflect. Um, sometimes it comes at me and, I, and for me to be able to get through, I have to get it down and, and, and get it out. Um, but there, my other part of my process too, in those times when it comes like that, I still have to go back and work on editing and doing all of those writerly <laughs> things that need to happen. But first I have to record that, that moment in that space. Yeah. What you were saying, um, you know, about writing about current events and this, um, you know, fight for racial justice that we're seeing right now made me think um, of the question of what the writer's role is with resistance movements. And um, if there is an intersection between kind of activism and writing um, in your minds as writers, and maybe we can start with Pam on this one. Yeah, um, you know, it's hard because I think that as these events have unfolded over the past few weeks, I myself personally have put away writing and just like jumped feet first into things that are, as, as Trapita said, urgent, things that have like, um, can make market differences, that actions that perhaps can have exponential uh, returns right now for the movement. At the same time, I think I have to keep reminding myself that that I, I don't know, my role as an artist is a little bit different. It is a little bit more of a reflective role. Um, you know, something I think about a lot is, is the fact that I draw this interesting line between the activists I know in my life and the science fiction writers I know in my life because they are both possessed of the sort of like greatest imaginations I know. And it may not be an obvious comparison at first, but I do think that's what we often do with our art is we imagine worlds and even if we're writing realism maybe it's a world that's just a teeny bit different from the one but in order to enact change you have to have the power to imagine something different than what is going on and i do think that is one of the really crucial roles that writers continue to play um and that may be a slower effect that we have it may not, not be something we do immediately and again i'm not saying that we should all go out there and be like writing like complete fiction that only comes from a political place but i do think the especially if you're a marginalized writer just having that imagination and creating those worlds for people to think and feel a little bit differently is absolutely essential yeah if others have anything else to add on this i would welcome that and before i transition to a few more ad advice oriented questions for um the panelists. Yeah. Stephanie, I look. Yeah. No, Trippy, go ahead. No, I, I was just quickly going to say we also, writers have to survive, <laughs> you know, and you have to use whatever tools you can do to do that because, as uh, I think Pam or someone was saying, the, our, the voices are really important. Um, I kind of am between the observer and the reflector and then the action oriented person. So sometimes I I ride that line and there's, there's a line I've been saying a lot, you know, I'm doing the very best I can. 
and that can be day by day. You know, um, there's so many stories we want to tell, but sometimes you just have to sit and reflect. It is a lot um, right now. So I just want to put that on there. The, the primary duty is you have to be kind to yourself so that you can be a vessel where you can, you can be able to tell, tell these stories that you need to tell. You actually articulated something that I was thinking and wouldn't have said as clearly, but that there's like a split in the writer right now. And Pam was saying the same thing between, you know, this, the citizen, right? Your active civic duty, which feels like it is taking everything from us to listen, absorb information, take action. But then the writer is also part of your job, your vocation is to record and to witness. And I feel, I feel that I'm not able to do that all the time when I'm reacting, when I'm in constant motion busyness, which I feel like all of quarantine, even before the racial uprising was so destabilizing that I was spinning. And that's not my best writer self. I think there's time for both though. And it feels to me that the writer's responsibility at this moment is more public facing, more on the active, um, less, less um, kept in a room, synthesizing information side of things. That's how I have been feeling lately. Thank you all. I'm I'm gonna switch gears a little here for some um, kind of practical advice questions for uh, many of our audience tonight have just wrapped up their first day of workshops for Aspen Summer Words and you all attended the conference in Aspen. So a little, a little different than this year's participants who are doing these virtual workshops. Um, but I still think um, there are some things that, that will translate from your experience to theirs. And I'd love to hear any advice that you have um, for these students who are embarking on, on workshops um, and anyone really who's, who's doing a writer's conference or a workshop. So why don't we start with um, Trapita, just because I, I know you most recently attended Summer Words last year, so it might be the most fresh in your mind. <laughs> yes, it was such a wonderful experience. It's always fresh in my mind. Um, yeah, I can say that I'm going to pull from it the things that I've valued. Uh, and I don't necessarily think you need to be sitting in the room to be able to still get this. Um, one, I went into the Aspen workshop with a strong desire to do work. Because for me, I took a week off vacation, a week from my job. Um, and I, so I would say my advice would be really understanding why is important to you and why you're participating. And for me, I wanted to fin finish my manuscript. Um, I wanted to work. I wanted to get advice and be open. So that's the first thing. Really use this opportunity. I was so grateful that uh, Yolanda Wisher had, you know, um, put my name out there for this. And it was, I came back and mailed her a gift because I said, this was really a gift to me and I appreciated the opportunity. So, so finding out what, why is important to you, putting in the work. And the other part was building a community. And I, there were a couple of people that I encountered um, in my Aspen experience that were gonna be lifelong friends. Um, and not only friends in the, hey, let's catch up, but having that community of supporters, um, I would say to even in a virtual world, to connect with someone that you can, um, you don't necessarily have to be, you know, poet to poet or fiction, whatever, but connect to someone that can be also your accountability partner, your support partner, your BS meter, <laughs> all those things. And I feel like I've found, um, in, you know, uh, someone in that program. So that, you know, committing, taking the time seriously, and then also building that community, you know, being open to learning. I think you summed it up really well, but if there's any other advice to add, please jump in. Um, Eileen. Um, I would say the two things. One being in some words for me, it wasn't to finish a manuscript, but it was kind of to like prove my concept. Like I thought that this 
would work, but I wasn't sure. And I'd never written a book, although I'd been a journalist for many years. And it was really super helpful just to have a whole community of writers and being able to read and share it and understand that it could work and how it could work and how it might be structured. That was really helpful. Um, and I think if you had to give advice as a writer, I was thinking about the most useful piece of advice I've had. And actually it came so late in my, well, in my career up till now. Um, it came about three years ago when I was writing a piece on what happened to my ex-husband for the New York Times. And um, they wanted to put pictures in the story, like photographs of him. And I was really torn about whether or not I should do it because there were some photos of my kids and they said, it's really going to humanize him. It's going to make him seem more like a person and not just this lawyer, this like rich guy that this thing happened to. And um, I remember saying to the producer of the package, I just said, I, I just don't know, you know, I don't know if I want to go that far. And she said, I think the thing that really resonates with readers is authenticity. And if you're going to do this, you need to do it authentically. You need to like tell the whole truth and put your whole self out there. And, you know, she was right. And I did, and it was very scary, but it, it, it hugely resonated. And I think one of the reasons why is that I just kind of, I opened myself up and I just threw it all in there. And, um, and I think people can see that really clearly. They can understand if you're being authentic and honest and really vulnerable. Um, and I think it's clear when someone is guarded and, and not doing that, so. That's super helpful. And I think we'll transition to audience questions soon. And last, Pam and Stephanie, you have any last writerly advice, either general or for, for summer word students? Um, I, I don't want to not give you the chance. Um, but we do have lots of questions. So I think I will move to that and give our audience a chance to get their, to get their questions answered. All right, let's see. Um, so this question is for Trapita first, and then I think others can jump in. What are aspects of starting a writing career that you'd love to go back in time and tell yourself to savor or live? Oh, what a great question. Um, I would love to tell myself to stop fretting so much and to believe in my voice earlier. Um, I always, when I teach, uh, do teaching artist work, um, or workshop, I always say, I think there was 10 years of my life that I took off. I just, um, I've always presented hourly as someone who's very confident. I never had an issue with that. But for my writing, um, there was, I didn't have that level of confidence. Um, I wish that I had listened at the time a little bit more to people who really did believe in that voice and found it to be authentic and beautiful and wonderful. And it wasn't until years later that I too found that. Um, so that's the thing I would savor. I would savor that. And then I would also, um, I would put as much energy in the early years that I did into trying to work and survive also into my craft and my writing, because that, that, that was the reason why I survived. Not so much because I had a job, but it was because I had an outlet that I could write. Um, so those are the two pieces that stand out most about that experience don't fret as much <laughs> don't fret um anyone else if uh, that was a great answer so i think i can um go to question two here um what's the best thing you can do to improve your writing besides actually writing uh let's start pam do you want to take this one Yeah, um, I think the best thing you can do to improve your writing, it's, it's a dull answer, but it's a reading. And especially, I think, reading outside your genre. Um, what I mean by that is, like, as a fiction writer, it's really important to read poetry. Um, it's important to read nonfiction. I, like, actually, you know, I had my undergraduate degree. I had a specialty in creative nonfiction, and I, like, was obsessed with the lyric essay. And I don't write lyric essays anymore, but they come up in the way that I craft fiction. I sort of, like, stole those tools and used them in my work. Um, it's, it's just really important, I think, to read outside your direct line of influences because you don't want to just be replicating what's been done and you're going to get sort of like fresher insights from, from reading broadly. I just want to agree with that 100%. Um, and I do have a practice of reading poetry daily and it's a huge part of my life and 
um, so much so that people sometimes ask if I would ever write poetry and I'm like, absolutely not. The whole joy <laughs> of it is that it's, that I'm not reading it, reading within my own canon, trying to figure out how someone did something. I'm just, I mean, I'm just having a spiritual connection when I'm reading poetry and it never fails. I mean, walking is really great too, but I, I think it's reading widely. I think everyone here is going to say reading poetry. <laughs> reading. Just, yeah. <laughs> I've discovered so many um, poets through your Instagram, Stephanie. So thank you. <laughs> like my greatest joy is just to share poetry with people. I don't want to talk about my own work. I would just love to talk about poets every day. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, this next one is um, on writing nonfiction. So it's for Stephanie and Eileen. When writing nonfiction pieces that involve family and friends, I end up dealing with a lot of guilt and reluctance at the thought of sharing those stories. Any advice for dealing with this feeling? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, I go into a moral sociopathic blackout while I'm writing where I don't care about anyone or anything and that includes not just the people I'm writing about but my own shame. I, I mean I'm talking about Stray in particular. I don't have a background in nonfiction writing so this is just what this book needed. You will always have a chance to dial it back, but I think that it's so hard to tell the truth to start with that you have to kind of over overreach in a way. And in general, when I'm writing, it's one of the few times in my life where you're like not accountable for likability. And this is the first draft when you're just by yourself. And so I would encourage people that are trying to write pieces like that to be as ruthless as possible in the first draft and know that you're going to have many chances to refine it. Um, and ultimately you have to decide for yourself what's worth it. Um, I can't, I'm not close with my parents. So that freed me in a way when writing this book. So I can't really say what it would be like to see them every Sunday and have them had just read all these secrets of theirs that I published. So yeah, Eileen, I'm, I'm not sure how it is for you. Oh, it's so funny. I'm like the opposite of you. I'm like, I was writing and thinking they're going to hate me. They're going to hate me. They're like, and I, I, I wish I wish I had spoken to you before I had written it because I'm used to writing other people's stories as a journalist. And that feels like you can be, you know, it sort of feels like it was an on the record conversation or whatever's happening. That doesn't feel weird. But writing about my ex-husband, knowing his family would read it and learn a lot of things about him that they didn't know. And also that the whole world was going to know things about him that, were, um, that weren't that flattering. You know, he was an intravenous drug addict. He lied, he, you know. Um, but there were also good things in it. And I struggled so hard with that. So that question is such a good one. And I had a lot of therapy and you know, I, I wrung my hands a lot and I talked to friends about it. But I think in the end, I agree with Stephanie in service of the story, and I felt like there was an important reason to write it, I decided that as long as I was fair and I was honest, I think Annie Lamott has that quote that says, if you um, wanted to be written well about, you should have behaved better or something like that. But I sort of <laughs> felt like I was telling the truth and the truth is the truth. So, you know, if it upset some people, I understand that and I can accept that and I can be with that. Um, but I, but I, I decided not to stop myself from writing it just because it was painful. So I agree. Yeah. That corresponds with a lot that was said in a panel we did a few days ago on writing about real people with some of the um, Summer Words faculty and that we did record it and there'll be a video on our website in the next couple weeks. So whoever asked that question, there's a whole panel on it where you can get more. Um, this question, this next one's for um, Trapita. How do you find a writing community and accountability partners, especially outside of an MFA program? And others can also hop in after she kicks things off. Yeah, so um, it, it's, it, it's just been uh, 
trial and error, I suppose. There's been groups where, you know, you meet people at workshops or um, you meet individuals and you want to kind of keep it going. You want to keep this up. And it's just because life happens, it's not as easy. Um, so what I've learned is sort of a la carte. It's like a menu, right? So I'm not in the position to, at right now, be able to have a group that I can meet with, you know, every single week. Um, just because of a lot of life demands. But what I do have is someone that if they're, you know, I have a poem that I just wrote and I really want to share it, there's someone that I can call and share it. Um, I have a dear, dear poetry friend that if there are, you know, opportunities I want to explore and I have questions about it and she's aware of it or she's going through the same thing, we get on the phone and we hash it out. Um, we, I used to, for a brief period when we all had a project that we wanted to achieve, we, we met for a couple of months. Uh, we would meet every, every third week or so. And we were very, um, very direct about, hey, this is what we're gonna focus on. So the, the answer to that question is, um, it's not always a long, some people have had writing communities where they've been in for years. I have not had that, the luxury of being able to do that. But what I have done is find different people and resources and I piece it together. That's a lot about my writing life, right? How I'm piecing it together, but ultimately what matters is what comes out of that, not how I enter into it. So my advice would be to someone, if you can find a consistent community, great, find it. Uh, if you can pick from, you know, the strength from different people that you're aware of and you all can have an exchange, um, that's the route I went and it works for me. That's great. That was a very comprehensive answer. And hopefully it's also um, doing writers conferences and th not obviously that option is not available to everyone, but I hope that people participating this week will be able to find some of that community um, through yeah. summer words. Um, I think we have time just for one more question. And this is, this is a great one. Um, for those of you who've just published books this year, did publishing your first book, um, or Stephanie years ago was sweet better. And now your second book did publishing your first book though, change your life the way you thought it would. Why don't we start with you, Stephanie? Uh, my first book was a novel called Sweet Bitter that came out in 2016 and before it came out people were very giving with unsolicited advice about how everything would change. Being a, a published writer is different than being a non-published writer and that was the most profound change that I experienced. There's professional validation, but there's also this sort of, I've been allowed to enter the race. You, I think your imagination, I've published a book, like what else can I do? That is something that before I had published, I never let myself think like that. I'm gonna be in restaurants for the rest of my life. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna have to get a PhD after this. I'm gonna be stuck in academia. And that the sort of, there were a lot of limits. And I think having published one book, you, you get a certain amount of freedom in that way. It did not change the way people told me it would change. And all, you know, I, the people that are my friend family are still my friend family. And I still spend my days in a similar way where I have a day job and I write on the side and write at any moment I can. Um, and it certainly didn't bring the peace. There are so many people who are like, you must be so happy. You must be over the moon. And I'm just waiting any day now for that sort of like cloud, like Nirvana to descend. Um, it's not peaceful per se, but it is quite a prize, I think. Yeah. And every new book is like starting over in some way. <laughs> oh God, never again. I say that, I said that after Sweet Bitter, but <laughs> done, I'm all done. Pam, do you want to answer that? If publishing this debut novel has changed your life in the way you thought it would? 
Um, definitely not. You know, I think the, I'm sorry, that's not a great answer. What, what I mean by that is like one, you know, with the asterisk that it's all happened in pandemic. So maybe you'll feel real one day. I still haven't seen my book in a bookstore because we locked down very early in San Francisco. Um, I think what I mean by that is you expect these sort of moments of external validation to mean more than they do. And it's true. It's like when you get something in the New York Times with your name on it, you're like very excited. You're excited for maybe two days, maybe six hours, maybe an hour. But then that goes away because that isn't sustainable. And what's been honestly a struggle to sort of like figure out for me is that the only thing that gives that reliable source of, of not joy but satisfaction ultimately is writing and being on the page and nothing external can ever ever replicate that so I don't want to discount what a privilege it is to be published and as Stephanie sort of mentioned there are all sorts of doors it can open especially professionally and I think that's really really important for a lot of people especially those who want to um, you know make a fuller career in the literary world but internally and sort of in terms of artistic inspiration and sort of spiritual returns, nothing changed. Eileen, anything to add to those great answers? From and your said, I, I want to jump into her square and just be like she said, that was so <laughs> true. I think, I, I think for me, because I had been published in the New York Times and other places, that's exactly how I remember the first time I had a piece in Harper's Magazine, which, you know, 15 years ago, it felt like a huge accomplishment. And I was right above Margaret Atwood. Like, and I thought I was like, I remember I had the magazine and I thought, look at that. And then my kids were screaming because they wanted to eat dinner. And I was like, well, that's that, you know, like and <laughs> five minutes later, it was like, what's next? And I think it can be very kind of, um, it's kind of a, like an addiction, sort of like, there's that rush. I'm in the New York Times or they reviewed my book, you know, wherever. But then after that, you still have to get back to your life. And so I agree with Pam. I think when you're in, when you're in it and you're writing and you're feeling all that joy from writing, that's where the, that's the sweet spot. It's not, it's not just holding the book and thinking, oh, look what I did. I mean, that's a wonderful feeling. I feel very grateful that I was able to publish a little bit before the lockdown, but that's not, that's not the ultimate. I don't think that's where the meaning and the satisfaction in life as a writer will come from just having the book. I think it's more than that. I think that's a, that's a great way to end. Finding joy in the process, I think, is something that um, we, we can all learn from. Um, I want to thank you all for taking this time um, and for being so generous with your stories and sharing um, your experiences and advice. Um, for those who have not read these books yet, um, do put them on your summer reading list. Um, they are all wonderful. And check out trapitamason.com to stay um, up to speed with everything that Trapita is doing as Poet Laureate in Philadelphia. Um, we've just posted a, a link to the email. Sign up for Aspen Words updates. Um, you can follow us on social and also go to aspenwords.org to learn more about what we're doing um, virtually. So thank you again to all of our panelists, Stephanie Dandler, Eileen Zimmerman, Pam Chong, and Trapita B. Mason. Thank you, and have a great night. Bye, thank everyone. You.